You know, it's really special to be able to walk over here and look in these display cases and remember all the things that I found, all the adventures with buddies. And uh, I've been very lucky over the years, very fortunate. Um, some of this stuff is just absolutely incredible. There's a lot of finds of a lifetime in here. I'll tell you, I wanna share with you guys today some pro tips of mine, some things I learned along the way. And I have a very simple system that I created called the Rule of Sevens. It's something I created so that I could teach people at seminars, metal detecting clubs, and I'll even teach you right now in this video. It's a way that you can learn some of the pro tips and tricks for the Equinox 800 to get you out there in the field so that you can find incredible things like these. All right, hey, welcome to my video on pro tips for the Equinox 800. These are a lot of the tips that I use and techniques that I use when I'm in the field with any machine really, but these specific ones are for the Equinox 800. We'll talk a lot about just Equinox 800 stuff, but there are a few tips in here that you could use in any machine. So let's get started and we have some uh, good footage that we brought along with us where we went out in the field and we're able to try some of these things out. So to get started, I wanna talk about the um, startup procedure. And what I mean by that with the Equinox 800, you take it out of the vehicle, you set it down and turn it on and you take off and start detecting. What do you do first? So there is a procedure that I recommend to you that you do first. And usually with the Equinox 800, it's pretty simple. You know, a lot of the uh, owner's manual and quick start guides and videos that you'll see out there tell you to start with noise cancel, go right to ground balance and you're off and running. Well, I have a few more steps that I like to uh, have you do before you do that. So let's take a trip out into the field real quick and I'll show you that in action. All right, here we go. Okay, let's talk about what I think is the most important step of the whole day when you go out detecting. I don't care if you're in a park or at the beach or like today where I'm in a field. Uh, what we need to do is a whole procedure of startup. So I really like the way that MindLab laid the machine out where on the icons here it shows from left noise cancel to ground balance and then just starting at the icon on the left, that's probably the first thing you want to do is noise cancel followed by ground balance. But before we do that, there's a whole bunch of other things you should probably do first. So that includes just basic settings like how many tones you're gonna to be in, what your sensitivity is gonna be at, what iron bias you're gonna be running, what recovery speed you're gonna be running. You wanna do all that first and get the machine the way that you're gonna run it, but especially before you do a ground balance. Because running the machine with a ground balance of nothing, I'm sorry, with a uh, sensitivity of nothing compared to a full sensitivity and doing a ground balance, you may get two completely different numbers. Same thing with the uh, noise cancel. Having your sensitivity way low, you may not hear a problem frequency that you're gonna hear when you get up to 20 on your sensitivity. So before we do that, let's go ahead and do a couple of things to get started with before we even start with noise cancel and ground balance. I'm gonna toggle with the uh, icon here all the way over to the right, and I'm gonna check on recovery speed over here. Right now it's at four. I'm gonna run it pretty high today. I'm gonna go all the way up to seven. And then we're going to hold the icon down again until we get to the sub menu. And iron bias, I'm gonna run that way up there today too to seven. And let's see, for sensitivity, I'm at 20. 20 is perfect for me today, that's what I'll run, 20. And I already know that I'm in 50 tone and everything else is set the way that I want it. So now that I have those things set and I'm gonna run the machine this way, it would be time to go ahead and start with the first thing on there which is noise cancel. All right, we're at belt height, and we'll just tap this button over here. Oop, let me go back over there. Timed out. And tap this button. And if there's another detectorist near you, it probably wouldn't hurt for you to kind of have this aimed at that person or at your EMI source, like those wires in the distance over there. I see some wires. So anyway, having done that, now we're ready to detect it except for one thing, which is ground balance. Find a good, nice, clean place to do this. So out here, that's kind of tough because this place is loaded with iron. So out here, I, uh, before I even started this procedure, this video clip, I found a nice little clean area right here that I can ground balance on. I have a lot of mineralization out here in California. Sometimes the dirt is like blood red from the amount of iron in the soil. There's a lot of minerals out here. So I like to do a ground grab. A lot of the videos you'll watch online suggest that you run a ground balance of zero. And that does work for a lot of people in a lot of places, but here where I'm at, I'm gonna grab the ground. So let's go over to ground balance and hold this 
check mark button over here in and pump the coil. Before we do that, let me put this right here. There we go. Let's try that again. Okay, it's at 22. And I'm gonna leave it there. I'm not going to turn on auto tracking for me. The soil out here is pretty uh, consistent everywhere that I'm gonna be swinging today. It's not a very big area, but you could put it in auto tracking if you wanted, but basically I'm ready to go. So hit this button and we're off and detecting. All right, let's go find something. So the next thing I wanna to talk to you about is the rule of sevens. Now this is a system that I teach at seminars and detecting clubs and, and anytime I get a chance to talk to somebody who owns Equinox 800, this is the system that I teach. And the reason I call it the rule of sevens is it has several different things in it that all relate to the number seven. Makes it pretty easy to remember if you have just one number to remember in your head. But I wanna preface this by saying that this system really only works when you're in the iron or when you're in a park and you're in the sweet zone and you know, you're in an area where there's a lot of signals, you're trying to get the coins out of the park and in my situation, more often than not, I'm in the field. So if you're in the field and you're in an area where there was occupation and there's iron in the ground, a lot of signals, and you're trying to get the good stuff out, you're trying to pick out the little high tones and things that are hiding in the iron, System of Sevens works fantastic. We start by doing the recovery speed at a seven, then we do iron bias at seven, and then our swing speed is seven seconds. And what I mean by that is if you start here, and you swing all the way across and come all the way back to where you started. That whole pattern from here back to here should take seven seconds. And that's a pretty good swing speed for these settings. Now, when you change settings on the Equinox 800, it can, it can actually change your swing speed a little bit. With some certain settings, you could swing faster. And with other settings, you would need to be slower than that. But with the seven on the re uh, recovery speed, seven on the iron bias, uh, you need to run seven second swing speed. And the last seven is, is when you come up on a target and you see the ID on there and the ID shows up and it's varying, let's say it's 11, 12, nine, 11, 12. If you take the lowest number, which was a nine and the highest number, which was a 12, the difference is only three. If I see a difference of more than seven between the lowest number and the highest number, I walk away. I don't dig those. And you know, these settings aren't um, the holy grail. Uh, they're not written in stone. These are just the settings that I use and I'm telling you I've have you know Many hundreds if not thousands of hours on the Equinox 800 and these are true tried and tested system that um, These numbers work the sevens work perfect and if you're in iron or you're in a park with a lot of signals This is something you need to try so let's go ahead and take you to a clip real quick and I'm gonna the first thing I'm going to show you here is a clip on the um, variety of uh, the ID. So when the ID changes and it's a full seven points between, you know, it's anything higher than that, we don't dig it, anything less than that, we do. Let's take you to this clip real quick and show you one where, on this one, I have a, uh, a clip where the numbers are really close together and we'll go ahead and dig that one and see what we get. Here we go. Okay, so we're talking about a change of seven or greater that I usually don't dig those, but check this one out. 17 and does not vary. Let's turn on it. 17 does not vary. So that's usually a coin, a shotgun shell, a round ball, but you get the picture. It's something round with even edges. And usually when you see that number, you could get a little excited, you know, especially if you're looking for coins and you're in an area where there could be coins. And it could be a button or anything round though. So highly suspicious that there's something round. It's out. It's right here somewhere. Really close. There it is. Well, it's not perfectly round, <laughs> but it's, uh, in fact, it has kind of a weird edge on it. Big old chunk of lead though. And uh, it's older, you know, it's got that white color. So it's at least 100 years old probably, but when you do see a target that gives you numbers that don't vary very much like this, and it's just staying 17 both ways and didn't give you any variation at all in the number, just be careful when you're digging it because it could be a coin or a round item like, you know, something, some other kind of relic, like a button or something. So take an extra second to dig that out carefully, a little berth around the edges, and that way you won't scratch your coin. Okay, we're back. 
Let's go ahead and look at another clip here. This next clip is where the numbers are greater than seven apart. Let's take a look at that clip now. Okay, here's a good example of my, kind of the rule of sevens that I use, that I talked about. And what we're doing is we're listening to the signal. We got an 11, 21, 23. So the lowest number I saw was 11 and the highest number was 23. That's a difference of 12. That's more than seven. 12 is quite a bit more than seven. So let's go ahead and dig it and see if I'm right. Okay, here it is right here. I have it right here. Let's lift it up and see if it'll come out. So as you can see, the rule of sevens was right. All right, next thing I wanna talk about is headphones and how important headphones are. And headphones is a tool that you can use to hear more of what's going on, more of what your machine's telling you. If you're not using headphones for some reason, it's a huge disadvantage for you. The advantage would be to have headphones, have them set up correctly, have the tones correct in your head. I use 50 tones on the Equinox 800. A lot of people don't like that because I hear a lot of people in videos saying it's too much information coming in. Well, at my level of expertise, I need all the information I can get. I do like the detail of 50 tone and I highly recommend that you start and learn 50 tone and just get used to it because there's a lot of information in there that's valuable that can help you determine whether or not you want to dig something and you just don't get all that information with three or five tone. So anyway, headphones are super important. You can see I use headphones on all my machines and the only time I don't use it is when I'm making videos for you guys just so you can hear what's going on. But I do wear headphones and I do have both ears on most of the time when I can. The only time I don't do that is when I'm trying to maybe listen for a buddy who's nearby, snakes or something like that. I want to hear my environment a little bit. I'll pull one ear back off a little bit. Quick story on that. A buddy of mine told me that he heard a rattlesnake and it was just starting to get dark one night. He says, I got a rattlesnake over here and I could hear it with my headphones slightly pulled off in one ear. So I walked over towards my buddy and he says right there and he pointed at it and I walked right to the rattlesnake and looked down and I'm standing right at it. It's right, you know, I can hear it. It's right five, six feet in front of me. I look down and I don't see the snake anywhere. And my buddy says, what are you doing? And I said, I'm looking for the snake. He goes, way over here. And I just couldn't believe that my ears were telling me something that was that wrong. And then I forgot that I had only one ear covered. When I took them off, my whole perspective changed and I walked right to the real snake. So anyway, I wear headphones all the time when I can and I like to leave both ears on to get all that information, especially when you're trying to listen to tones. But um, when it's a safety issue, of course, you know, one halfway off is a good idea. The next thing I wanna talk about is the swing speed. We kinda already talked about that and it should be a good, you know, seven seconds across. And I think the uh, owner's manual on the MindLab Equinox 800 recommends three to four seconds per swing. And if you took three to four seconds, that's six to eight sevens right there anyway. So let's go ahead and take a look at a clip on that on swing speed. Okay, so as an example to you, I'm gonna show you a bad habit, which is I'm gonna run the swing speed pretty high in heavy iron. So what, what's gonna happen is you're gonna hear, hear a whole bunch of weird and there's gonna be multiple signals coming out at once. And if you're not taking the time to slow down and investigate what the different sounds are, what you're hearing sometimes is multiple tones at the same time. Like a bidder doop, that's three different tones. B do doop, right? So that meant that there was something going on back there where there was at least two different metals telling you something. But swinging this fast and this kind of stuff is not gonna help you at all. This is where you want to slow down to this. This is the correct swing speed in here. Two different metals right there. You would have never heard both of those different signals there if you were swinging fast. This is a pro tip right here that's super important. Like I said, that even the experts are guilty of sometime, myself included swinging too fast so you want to have the advantage slow down okay next thing i want to talk about is pinpointing now you wouldn't think that pinpointing would have anything to do with a pro tip but it does 
especially with the Equinox 800. There's, you know, a lot of us content creators out there is making these videos for you. And several of them that I've watched have talked about when they hear a signal and they turn 90 degrees on it and try it again, if they don't hear it, they leave. They don't dig it. They want to hear a good signal this way, turn 90 and hear it again. And I want to talk about a special circumstance where you may hear it perfect one way, turn 90 degrees and it's gone, but I go all the way around to 180 and I do a 180 check as well. Most of the time I even do a 270. I do a full 360 degree check in four different angles. And the reason I do that is I found that the 180s a lot of times are good targets. Let's go ahead and take a look at a clip right now on a 180 target that turned out to be good. And more often than not, these turn out to be a coin on edge. So let's take a look at that clip now. So talk about another pro tip here. And that is when you hear a signal like this, we have a good repeatable 13, 14, the numbers are stable, sounds good. Let's turn 90 on it like we always should. Check it again. And now I lost it. It's really hard to get. If I go 180, it's back. So I'm running some really aggressive settings on this machine right now where only, uh, well, pretty much all iron is being discriminated out right now. So my, my suspicion is, is that it's not iron because of the fact that I have the machine set up to clamp down so hard on iron. But I wanted to show you that even though we lost it on a 90 and it came back on the 180, sometimes that could be an object laying on its side in a weird angle. If I would have got it over here first and it was banging here and I turned 90 on it and it was gone and I turned 180 and it was gone, 270 still gone, I would have walked on and not even thought about digging it. But this one's got a good 180 on it and that's sometimes, in my opinion, I found this to be a coin on its side or an object with a weird shape. So let's go ahead and dig that and see what it is. There it is. I knocked it out of the hole so far that I couldn't find it, but there it is. It's a nice little relic, it's brass. So we need to be hearing stuff like that, but there's an example of something that the old um, turn 90 on it, and if it doesn't sing, leave, is not always right. I found it to be that weird shapes and coins on sides can, can give you a good 180 on, a, on an object. First of all, I had the machine clamped way down on iron hard, so that was a clue that this was not gonna be iron. Second of all, it sounded so good and gave me stable numbers, that's another clue, and it sounded good on both ends, 180. So there's a good example of why you should dig your 180s and not just walk away if you get nothing on a 90. And what I mean by these numbers is, obviously there's 360 degrees in a full circle, right? Half of a full circle, therefore, is 180 degrees. So I just turned completely opposite and it sounded good still. But when I turned just 90 degrees or 270 degrees, it wasn't hitting. So, but it could have been something good. That could have been a, you know, a buckle or a button or who knows. But lesson learned and a good pro tip. Okay, you see what I mean by that? And like I said, I, if I had clips to show you of all the times I've dug a 180 and had a coin laying right on edge, you wouldn't believe how often I'm just completely flabbergasted that I took the time to dig that, took the chance, and it always pays off. So here's another clip where we do a 180 and even a 90, and we just don't like it. Let's take a look at that clip, and this one we had to walk away from. All right, here's another signal, speaking of the rule of sevens. This one is just 10 feet from the last one. Fourteen, thirteen. I saw a twenty-five in there. Mostly it's fourteen, fifteen though, and staying pretty stolid on fourteen. The twenty-five I'm not sure about. Let's turn ninety on it, check it again. Goes away on the ninety. something else over here. Let's turn 180 on it. So we're gonna move on. I can't even get it to repeat. Okay, let's talk about pinpointing a little more. One thing I wanna tell you is that the Equinox 800 can do something called detuning in pinpoint mode. 
and I'll have a little clip there to explain what that means. But basically what I'm saying is, is if you get a big pinpoint on something, you can take the machine and by toggling on and off out of pinpoint mode, it'll bring it all the way down to just a eh, 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 and you can get a real tight pinpoint. My pinpointer does that too. Let's take a look at a clip that kind of explains all this and shows it in action. So I got a signal right here. That's a 20. Moving around a little bit, mostly 20. Turn 90 on it. Still 20. Turn again. Yes, yeah, banging 20 the whole time. So it sounds good. Let's go ahead and pinpoint that and let's talk about another pro tip of mine, which is talking about pinpointing. And the reason this is a pro tip, you wouldn't think pinpointing would have anything to do with a professional tip, but the reason is, is hey, if you're pinpointing more accurate and you can recover a target quicker than everybody else that's hunting with you, at the end of the day, you're gonna probably have more digs and more finds in your pouch than the slower diggers. So pinpointing is super important from that perspective. Also, if you're off on a pinpoint, and you drop your shovel down and you start digging and you run your shovel right into a coin and destroy a beautiful silver coin or something because you weren't pinpointing correctly, that makes for a bad day too. So anyway, let's pinpoint this. We'll hold this button in right here. So we get a real quick left and right, but if we go forward and back, actually this one's not too bad. But what I was gonna show you is if you uh, detune this machine by pinpointing and off, pinpointing and off, pinpointing and off, you're detuning the machine down. I'll, ex I'll show you an example of what detuning is with my pinpointer because it does it as well. That way you'll understand the concept. And next time you go to pinpoint with your Equinox, you can do the same thing. Let's drop down on this and see what it sounds like with my Garrett pinpointer. So this is a Garrett AT pinpointer. It has the detune feature on it. So as I drop down to pinpoint this, I'm getting it right here, but I'm also hearing it way over here. And over here, I'm, I got a line here, still buzzing right here, all the way up to here and here. So somewhere in this square is where it's at. It's probably gonna be in the middle, okay? But look at the width of that square. It's a small little item right here, but it, look at the width. So if I hold this right over the item and then just tap this button one time on here, I detune this. Now, this pinpointer has been knocked down in sensitivity so that it's only gonna hear what's right underneath it. Now, I only get it right here. If I move my pinpointer in any direction from right there, it's gone. It's only literally right there. That's telling me that that item is directly under this pinpointer right now. So I know exactly where that item is. If we dig it, we'll show you. Straight down. And if, if this is a coin, I'll know that I, you know, I was careful enough not to come right down on top of the coin because I know where the coin is. Less of a chance to damage the coin. Okay, should be out by now. Let's recheck it. All right. Still in the hole. Oh, no, it's out. Here it is right here. So it's not a coin, but it is a relic. It could have been a coin. It's a period relic of some type. I wanna say that it's made out of brass maybe. It might be a lid of an old, this was an old saloon right here that burned down. It could be the lid off of something, but it's old. And it could have been a coin, look at the shape of that. And we could have damaged it. So. Anyway, having said that, I wanna show you that you know, this machine can detune just like this pinpointer can, and that's a good way for you to get exactly where the item is before you dig. <clears throat> it's especially powerful technique if you're using the six inch coil, because the six inch coil, by the way, this machine pinpoints right under the shaft, so directly under the shaft is where the item is. If you zero in right here, detune it all the way down to right there, it's literally gonna be right under the shaft. Let's keep moving and see what else we can find. Here's another clip where we did a detune on it and it was a deep object. Let's take a look at that clip. Okay, got a pretty good signal right here. 15, 16. And uh, 
Let's turn 90 on it. Still there. You can see it's got full bars on the depth, so it's at least six inches, if not eight inches down. Let's go ahead and pinpoint that real quick. And we're gonna just hold in the pinpoint button down here. See how wide of an area we get on the pinpoint? That's because of the depth. It's super deep. If we let go and hit the button again, try it again. It detunes the machine so that it's only gonna hit right on the item. So now, it's not a wide pinpoint anymore. It's a very small little pinpoint area. So now I'm right on top of it. So that's a whole different pinpoint than the first one I did where it gave me a big giant wide area. Now it's just telling me it's right under that little red part of my coil, right under the shaft. So let's get down. I don't think I'm gonna hear that with my regular pinpointer because it sounded like it was pretty deep, but let's check it with the pinpointer. Which by the way, I always check every signal with this pinpointer before I dig. Yeah, as I expected, it, uh, it's not hitting on the pinpointer because it's too deep. So we're gonna have to, um, let me get down a little ways and, until I can hear it with the pinpointer and we'll check back in. So I'm pinpointing it right here. Just picking it up right now. It's every bit of six inches down like we thought it was. Is that it right there? Nope. All right, let's check the hole. Oh boy, we're definitely either, it's either out or really close. Okay, it's out. There it is right there. It's the same thing I just found a little ways away. Actually, you know what, it's not. I think this is a, um, a lock swing. So a padlock had a little swing cover over the hole and you turn this and you put your key in and turn, turn a lock, but this protected the hole. That's what that is. So it's gonna have writing on it or designs or a name or something probably, but that's a, uh, a lock swing. So anyway, brass, super deep, very cool. And uh, you can see how the pinpointer was pinpointing it really wide until we detuned the machine then it got super focused and told us directly where it was at. And it was right. So that's one of my pro tips that you, uh, you'll you just have more productivity if you do that. Yeah, so you can see how nice it was that this deep target was able to detune and just pinpoint right over it. This way you have less of a chance of damaging a target by being off on your pinpoint. Had that been a nice coin or a valuable relic or something, you probably would not have damaged it at all because you knew exactly where it was at. So the Equinox 800 is one of the very few machines on the planet that can do this. So take advantage of it. Since your machine can do it, you should always do it. Okay, next thing I wanna to talk to you about is lifting your coil off the ground when you're pinpointing. Let's take a look at a clip on that right now. All right, I got a signal here, 2930, and it's showing Minimal depth on the depth meter, two inches down. So just even at two inches down, you're already suspicious that it's modern trash because it's super shallow. But let's lift the coil up and listen. Wow. So we're still getting it way up at 10 inches, almost a foot off the ground. That tells you a lot about it right there as far as size goes. Let's go ahead and dig that up real quick and see how big it really is. But I'm also at this point already very suspicious that it's shallow and bigger and more likely to be a can or some kind of bigger modern trash. All right, it's pinpointing right here. Let's get down there and see what it is. Okay, here it comes. It's down there quite a ways down. And there's our suspicions confirmed. An old 70s uh, beer can, hams. And you can see the old beaver tail on there. So that just goes to show you when you hear something that's two inches deep and it's 
screaming at you a foot off the ground, suspect that it's gonna be something bigger like this. Here's another one of those targets, another clip for you. All right, got a signal here showing a 16, 17, let's turn 90 on it. Still 16, 17. So there's hardly any variation at all on this. We raise the coil up, still getting it at 14 inches above the ground. <laughs> Maybe more than 14 inches. Let's see what this is. I like that the numbers were steady and consistent, but I don't like that it was still screaming at me at 14 inches off the ground. Even with the machine detuned, it's still showing a pretty big target right here with this detuned. So still a big item. Hey, I'm already on it, on the edge of it. It's definitely something big, bigger. Let's get the uh, pick down here to help us a little bit on this one and see what happens when I pull back on it. That's moving. So it's something very large. Here it comes. Look at this. Whole bunch of heavy chain here. Now you wonder why you were getting such an even number. It's probably hearing one of these round segments of the chain here and it was giving you a good number because of how round it was. That's all I can think. But we'll go ahead and pull this out and see what it is. There we go. All right, look at that. Old period. See the carriage bolt holes on here? Square holes, and there's a carriage bolt right there. This is all hand forged and old. This is period. And um, probably off some kind of a trailer or wagon or something. So we're gonna set this over here for now and give it to the landowner who likes stuff like this. And we'll keep moving. Okay, on this next clip here, on this one here, we're going to lift the coil up, but we'll notice that it doesn't get loud when we lift it up. It kind of just dies off pretty quick. Let's take a look at this. It turns out to be something small and not big and something deep. Here we go. All right, so I got a 14, 13 right here. Let's turn 90 on it. Same numbers, let's lift the coil up a little bit. Already gone at three inches. So it shows it's six inches down. So I'm getting about a total of eight or nine inches on this thing, whatever it is. Let's pinpoint it. Right there. See how it's full all across the top. All right, we'll get down and dig down about six inches and see what's down there. There it is. There's a pull tab of some type. But uh, yeah, nice and small though. Okay, one other pro tip that I found that works really good, especially if you're out looking for gold, you're at the beach, or even just in this case, we're relic hunting in this clip I'm gonna show you. And that is that I leave the pinpoint mode on. So if I put it in pinpoint and I get a good detune pinpoint and I like where it's at, I'll just set the machine down and the machine is set down still in pinpoint mode. That way, if I need to pick it up and verify the signal again, it's already in pinpoint. And it's just one step to save you having to go and try to re-pinpoint it. And you know, here's the thing, is yeah, you're saving seconds by doing this, but seconds throughout the day add up to minutes. And minutes, you know, over time adds up to hours. And you're just gonna be more productive. You're gonna get more digs, more signals than everybody else who's taking their time to re-pinpoint everything. So it's just a pro tip. 
you know, leave it in, in pinpoint mode and set it down and pick it right back up. It's ready to go. Here's a clip. Take a look now. So what I want to show you is I'm going to leave it in pinpoint. I know there's one right here. Right there, right? So I'm going to leave it in pinpoint, set the machine down, and just run right over it. It's still in pinpoint. It's out. So now you know it's out. You would get your little shovel out and find the nugget. I never had to turn it into pinpoint or take it out of pinpoint. It just sat in pinpoint the whole time waiting for me to pick it up and swing it. And you know, that's only seconds that you're saving, but those seconds add up. So just another thing you can think about for um, productivity, especially when you're in the sand looking for something, you know, at the beach or at the uh, gold fields trying to find nuggets. This is a great technique. Just leave your pinpoint on. Okay, I'm going to talk to you about productivity now. Productivity just meaning that you are making the best of your time. And one of the first things I want to talk about is just recovery speed. And what I mean by that, it's not a setting. I'm just saying how long it takes you to recover a target. You should be, if you're a pro, you should be trying to get the most out of your time. Now, let's take a step back for a second and realize that metal detecting is fun, relaxing, it's a hobby. And some people want to enjoy every signal, and that's fine. And, and, and that's how I am sometimes too. But in other cases, you may be wanting to try to get as much as you can out of a site while you're there. Maybe it was a long drive. It's a permission you only have today. You have other fellow detectorists with you who are, you know, there's a competitive nature to that. You want to try to get as much as you can out of the ground as fast as you can, you know, and therefore uh, making the best of your time. So your, your speed of recovery how fast you're able to get something out of the ground, you know, how quick you dig it and you, while being safe and not taking a chance to destroy it is super important. And the next thing is, is if you're in an area where you're getting a lot of signals, one rank amateur problem that a lot of people can't come to grips with, and I, even though I still tell people about it, I still witness it repeatedly. It's a hard thing to teach. And that is if we all get to a site and we start swinging our machines and there's two or three of us in the good sweet zone, and we're finding stuff, invariably one person, sometimes even me, will walk out of that area and try to find the next area. There's gotta be greener grass somewhere, right? There has to be um, you know, more signals over here, and then you're gonna go over there and find a whole new area, and you're gonna find some stuff that, well, no, it doesn't work like that. Most of the time, the good stuff is right here. You gotta get it while it's there, and my recommendation to you, if you wanna be productive, is stay in the sweet zone. Stay there where, everybody, where the other guys are. Get in there, you know, shoulder to shoulder, elbow to elbow, whatever you got to do, and get yours. And don't try not to wander off until the signals really start to die off and you're just not digging much. Then I would say, yeah, wander off. But a pro tip is to stay in the sweet zone as long as you can, no matter what. And that way you're going to have a better chance at finding something. You can always wander away a little bit later if you need to. And next thing I'm going to talk to you about now is uh, circling a target. So this is a pro tip, and this works for all machines and all metal detecting. What it is, is if you come up, you're out in a field and you're looking for iron, and it's pretty quiet, and you haven't found any big areas of occupation yet, you're just trying to figure out where people were living, you're in a park, you're trying to figure out where people were drop, dropping their coins, where they may have been you know, playing sports and losing rings, and right now, it's pretty quiet where you're swinging. And, you know, in this situation, if you come across a target, let's say you're in a field and you dig a square nail, you hear, you hear something, you dig it, it's a square nail. I get a little excited about that because somebody dropped a nail over 100 years ago right there. So what I do is I either set my pick down or my shovel or something or make a mark in the ground and I will start a spiral pattern and I'm spiraling out and out, out and away as I'm detecting from that nail. That way I can check, you know, three feet, six feet, nine feet, and even 15 feet away in all directions. If I don't hear anything else, I'll continue in my original direction probably and keep looking. But often, more times than not, you'll find that that nail is accompanied by other things. And they may be over here, they may be down here. But you're never gonna know if you don't do your spiral. A lot of times someone will come up on a nail and they're going this direction, they hit the nail here and just keep going without even ever checking over here or here and they missed where the iron patch really was. So always do a spiral pattern, and that way you're more likely to find out where the good stuff's at. Next thing I wanna talk about is something that really irks me, and we'll show you a little clip on that real quick, and this is what I call signal guy. Um, signal guy or signal girl, 
And these are the ones that call you over on a signal and they go, hey, I got a signal. And you come over and you listen to it and you, woo, man, that's nice. Can't wait to see what this is. Wow, that's nice, you know, and you confirm it and you back off and you're waiting for them to dig it. You're standing there and this is your detecting time that now you're, you know, watching them. You're a fan of them and you're rooting for them to see that they get something good. And they just continue to swing over this thing for like a whole two minutes. You're like, please, let's just dig it. So don't be signal guy or signal girl. Uh, if, you, if you get something good, you call somebody over. Um, as soon as you're done listening to it and, and, you know, why don't you, if you have to enjoy it and you have to, you know, take it all in, do that first, then call your buddy over. So anyway, this is just something that kind of irks me, but it does come back to productivity. And if you're making your buddy stand there for two minutes while you admire a signal, that's two minutes that he could have been, he or she could have been detecting back where they were to begin with. Let's watch a clip on that real quick. And we're still on the topic of productivity. How many of you have seen this person where they get this signal, it's a 20, 19, 20. They call you over, you come over there, you listen to it. Oh yeah, it's a 19 or 20. And you pinpoint it for them, it's right there, dude. There it is right there. And then you move off the way and you're expecting them to drop down and dig it right now because you just showed them where it was at. You listened to it, you found it, confirmed you could hear it. You showed them where it's at. All you want to see them is just dig it up and see what it is, right? But no, what they do is they take the coil back over again and just sit there for an hour doing this. Now, are they admiring it? I guess, I don't know. But when it comes to productivity, that is not productive. You, that's a bad habit of the person who has to swing over that thing for you know, a full two minutes listening to it. So a better way to do that would be to call your friend over if you want to, let them listen to it. And as soon as they walk away or you know, pinpoint or whatever, you can just quickly find it again and get in the ground and dig it out because all your friend wants to do is see what it is. They don't want to see you sit there and swing over it for another two or three minutes. There's too many videos on YouTube of guys admiring their, guys and gals, admiring their signals for way too long and just burning up YouTube time, your valuable time when you're sitting there and you're trying to learn something or get enjoyment. And it's excruciating to watch a prolonged swing over something and you have to listen to it, just this bad habit. So leave a comment if you've had this happen to you before down below. I wanna know if I'm the only person that's irked by this or if it irks you too. So lastly, a thing I wanna talk about, this is kind of wraps up our whole video on pro tips today is I wanna talk about um, something that I do when I get into a site and I first come in and you know those exciting moments when you first get to a site where you're in a park and you find a silver and you look around, there's no dig holes, you find another silver, you're like, man, no one's ever been over here because that silver quarter was only six inches down and this one was only three inches down. Somebody has never been over here. You get a little excited. Same thing happens when you're out in the relic fields and you come up on a site and you can look around and realize that there's no dig holes here, no footprints, no one's been here, there's no iron stacked up against the trees or the rocks, and you might be the first person ever at this site. And I have an old saying that I've said for a long time and it's true. You know, being very successful at metal detecting like I have been, it comes with over time, it comes with you know many thousands of hours of doing it, but it also, you know, it's this old saying is, it's 99% skill and 99% luck. And isn't that the truth? I mean, you could have all the skill in the world, but luck is so important. And, and you know, that's what it, what it really is. But I will say that if you're the first person into a site in a, a certain section in a park where they took some weeds out or they cut the, the grass down and now you're down this far into the grass or you're in a field where maybe there was a fire and there used to be berry bushes and they're all gone now and you're the first one in there or you're just in a field that no one's ever been in before, but you're in a virgin site. You're the first machine to swing over that area. Here's what I recommend you do. I recommend you go into what I call cherry pick mode. Let's watch a uh, real quick video on that. Okay, I got one last little tip for you. Let's say you wander into a site like this and you're hitting signals everywhere and you look around and there's no iron in the rocks anywhere. There's no signs of holes. And maybe you're the first person to even swing over this area. And you're noticing that like the first couple items you get are period, you get a nice coin or a nice relic, and you're thinking, boy, this is gonna be fun. What I usually do in situations like that is I go right into cherry pick mode on my machine. And what I mean by that is I go into my normal 77 settings. Let's look down at the machine here real quick. So I go into my normal 77 settings 
and we do that by going over to recovery speed. We'll bring that to seven, and then we'll hold this cog wheel in and bring this up to seven, and then hit detect. And now what I want to do is I want to take all this discrimination and run it all the way up to 14 because we're just going to cherry pick. We want the high conductors first. This way you get the most bang for your money the quickest you can. And then once you're done cherry picking, you can turn this off and come back in and get the low conductors and everything else. But let's get the good stuff quick and first. That way if you, know, you run out of light or you only have a certain amount of time or you're with other detectorists and you want to get the good stuff, here's how you do that. Just toggle over to the accept reject area and hit the check mark and then start going up, up, Looks like I missed one down here. Let me come back down and get that one. There we go. And just keep taking these away every time. Go all the way up to 14. You don't want anything from 14 down on the left side. And then just hit your button here. Do another ground grab if you can real quick. And then just you're in cherry pick mode right now. So right now you're only going to hear the good stuff. So anyway, that's my final uh, tip for you, my final pro tip is cherry pick mode when it's appropriate. And when is it appropriate? When you're running out of light, running out of time, it's a one day hunt because the permission's only for one day. You're with other detectorists and there's a little bit of competitive uh, edge there with the other detectorists on the ground. You know, one other time I'll use this technique is when I'm walking back to the car. Let's say it's been a long day and I'm tired, I'm hungry or whatever. And I'm just kind of swinging back to the car I'll go into cherry pick mode just so that I know that if I'm going to stop, it better be something good. So there you go. So that's it for my final tip. Okay. So I've heard a bunch of stories, you know, from buddies of mine. I don't know if it's ever happened to me, but there's so many stories out there. There's even a few YouTube videos on it. People were kind of cherry picking on the way back to their vehicles. They're walking out of an area and they're swinging fast. I wanted to tell you, if you're going to swing fast, on the Equinox 800. You gotta make sure that your recovery speed's up a little higher and maybe even lower your iron bias down to like five or something. But you gotta keep your recovery speed up there around seven if you're gonna swing that fast and, and walk that fast. But how many stories have you guys heard? I've heard them several times where people found some of their best finds of the day on the way back to the vehicle and sometimes even five, 10, 15, 20 feet from the vehicle, they find some of their most incredible things. So. It's always fun to be able to swing back to the vehicle. Anyway, that's it for now. That concludes my video on pro tips for the Equinox 800. And a lot of these pro tips could be used on any other machine as well. These uh, next couple videos that are going to pop up here at the end of the video are what YouTube thinks you should watch next. So check those out. In the meantime, take care and we'll catch you guys later.